Welcome back. In the first session, we learned that data links are a key element of command and data handling. A data link is provided by a physical bus, a data protocol and electrical signals. The combination is often referred to as data bus, although there could be some confusion in the terminology. We are going to look at the dominant data bus types implemented in spacecraft. The military standard 1553 is a very common uh, is very common in large spacecraft. People also simply call it MIL bus. The data bus comprises of a bus controller and up to 31 remote terminals. The bus controller could for instance be an onboard computer. A remote terminal could be a controller of a subsystem or it could be a router connected to multiple other subsystems. It uses two wires for a differential signal. Remote terminals tap into the same physical bus. This bus topology is called a linear bus. It is also a serial bus since all data is transmitted sequentially. All devices use coupling transformers to connect physically to the bus. In this figure you see a simplified version with only a single transformer. In practice there could be several passive elements depending on the distance between the tapping point and the remote terminal. The important aspect of the transformer coupling is that the main bus is protected against short circuits which can occur at the subsystems. As you can understand, this improves the overall reliability of the bus. The data of the mail bus goes up to 1 megabit per second. Here you see the data matches protocol for a transmission from the bus controller to a remote terminal unit. It all starts with a synchronization signal with a period equivalent to 3 bits. Why is this needed? Well, the remote terminal does not yet know at which exact frequency the data is provided by the controller. It needs to synchronize its clock first in order to be able to distinguish sequential bits. After the synchronization follows the address of the remote terminal. This tells for which remote terminal the message is intended. Next is a single bit which indicates if the bit controller will send a message to the receiver or expects a message back. This is then followed by a sub-address which can be used for devices connected to a router. Then it is specified how much words the message should contain. The message header ends with a parity bit which can be used to detect a single bit flip. In case of a transmission the header is followed by the message of n times 16 bits. The receiver subsequently acknowledges the reception by transmitting its address and providing a status word to indicate good reception or false. For receiving, there is a slightly different order in which the remote terminal first responds with its address and status word, followed by the message word of again a multiple of 16 bits. There are also different sequences which only contain status words or allow communication between remote terminals, but in all cases the bus controller leads the transaction. Now let me explain you the purpose of a differential signal. A differential signal simply means that the signal on one of the two wires is identical to the signal on the other wire, but in opposite direction. If we measure the difference, it simply looks like this. Now we look at the same signal, but this time there is an external electromagnetic noise present which distorts the signal. The wires are very close, so the electromagnetic disturbance coming from an external source is about equal and in the same direction on the other wire. If we look again at the difference, we see a clean block again, since the noise is cancelled out. This is called common mode noise rejection. Here you can see the differential signal as measured on a logic analyzer. The peak to peak differential is about 28 volts. This is very high compared to other buses and also very power demanding. So why is this? Well, the differential signal, the high voltage and a shielding around the signal wires makes this data bus very robust against electromagnetic interference. To enhance reliability further, this bus is typically implemented in a dual, triple or even quadruple redundant configuration. The high reliability is one of the most important reasons why this data bus 
which is already around since the 70s, is still implemented in many expensive spacecraft. It will, for instance, be used in the JUICE mission to watch Jupiter's moons. If you have followed the course on space exploration, you are probably very familiar with this mission. JUICE is planned for a launch in 2022 and will arrive in 2033. Imagine that by then, this data bus is already 60 years old. So let's take a look at a few alternatives. The I2C data bus is also a serial data bus with a linear bus topology. It uses one wire for a data signal and one for a clock signal. Both lines are pulled up to a reference voltage by the use of simple resistors. The reference voltage is typically 3.3 volt or 5 volt, similar to supply voltages of many integrated circuits. The master device controls the bus and communicates with up to 112 slave devices. The signal is generated by pulling down the lines to the ground. The data rate is for most practical cases limited to 400 kilobits per second. Thousands of integrated circuits have implemented an I2C controller, ranging from microcontrollers to special purpose devices. Compared to other buses, I2C consumes very little power. The maximum length of the bus is however limited to about 30 centimeters, making this bus unsuitable for large spacecraft. The availability and the low power consumption are however the reason that it's currently the most popular bus for a class of very small satellites called CubeSats. CubeSats are satellites of one or multiple units of 10 cm cubed. I2C is for instance implemented in the successful Delphi C3 and Delphi Next CubeSats, which are developed and operated at TU Delft. Each data message starts with a start condition from the master, followed by 7 or 10 bit address of the slave device. The read write bit tells the slave whether it will receive data or it needs to return data. The slave then needs to acknowledge that it is addressed and ready for the next action. Then the actual message or return data will follow, which is acknowledged after each byte. The message length can be up to 255 bytes. The message ends with the stop condition from the master. Here you can see how the data and clock line signals look like. The advantage of the separation of data and clock is that the slaves don't need to synchronize to the data transmission frequency. This in principle increases the reliability of the data bus. However, as this bus is not shielded, it is low voltage but not differential, both lines are very susceptible to electromagnetic interference and radiation events. A signal distortion on one of the lines can lead to a bit flip, which might not be too problematic. However, it can also lead to a missing address bit or a false start or stop condition. In practice, we see that the handling of such anomalies is sometimes poorly implemented in the integrated circuits and causes bus lockups to occur. In my own research on data buses, I discovered that the majority of CubeSats using I2C experiences problems with this data bus. In a few cases, this has even resulted to a complete satellite failure. The last data bus we are going to explore in depth is Spacewire. As the name already indicates, Spacewire is designed specifically for space applications by the European Space Agency. It uses a point-to-point -point bus topology, which means that one links only to another one other device. One of these devices can however be a router which connects several other devices via space wire and other data buses. Data rates go up to 400 megabits per second. The bus uses differential signaling like the mill bus. It has a data and strobe signal, which is similar but not exactly the same as with I2C. I will explain this later. The bus is full duplex, meaning that there are outgoing lines for data transmissions as well as incoming lines for reception. These lines can be operated simultaneously. The eight lines together with a shield line are wired via nine pin connectors. Spacewire allows automatic rerouting of the data in case of failures. This of course requires redundant links and routers. 
the combination of high data rates and high reliability make it a very popular bus for modern spacecraft. It is typically implemented in FPGAs and ASICs, which are devices which will be explained in a later session. The disadvantages are that it requires quite some effort to implement it in existing systems and it consumes relatively high power compared to, for instance, I2C. The message protocol is quite complex and will take too much time to explain and understand. If you are interested, you can find all the documentation on the website of ESA. We will now take a look at the signal properties of SpaceWire. The strobe signal will only alternate its logic level if there are two identical data bits in sequence. This is called data strobe encoding. This means that for each bit, either the data or the strobe signal changes its logic level, but never both at the same time. If we now apply a simple exclusive OR operation, you re can retrieve a clock signal, as you can see on the bottom of the graph. The advantage of this approach is that it is a simple method which yields more robustness against external and mutual interference of both signal lines. After all, a change of both signals at the same time is not allowed and can thus be determined as anomaly. I will now briefly tell you about some other data buses which are implemented in satellites and some candidates for future satellites. The first one is the Controller Area Network or CAN bus. CAN is a differential bus developed for the automotive industry. It is designed for time critical functions. Its recent versions support data rates up to 5 megabits per second. In terms of performance, power consumption and reliability, this bus takes the middle ground compared to the buses discussed before. Serial Peripheral Interface, or SPI, is a database which has close resemblance to I2C. However, it does not use digital addressing, but has a dedicated slave select wire per device connected to it. Also, it is full duplex. Its maximum data rate is only limited by the clock speeds of the master and slave device and can be up to several hundreds of megabits per second. For the rest, the advantages and disadvantages are similar to I2C. Time triggered Ethernet is a variant of Ethernet as you find it in your wired computer network at home or at work. It is a modified version to be more robust and to allow time critical operations but it can be connected to terrestrial Ethernet devices, such as a personal computer. Data rates currently go up to 100 megabits per second. One of its main advantages is that it is an extension of a widely adopted standard for terrestrial application. You can even think about your satellite as a network of devices which can be addressed through the Internet. We might see this bus in the near future in some satellites. RapidIO is a data bus for computer systems with extreme performance for time critical operations. The throughput is up to 10 gigabits per second for one lane and can even be multiplied by adding more lanes. It is implemented widely in mobile phone infrastructure, for instance the equipment at cellular towers. The performance and its robustness makes this point-to-point -point data bus interesting for some dedicated space instrumentation with very high performance requirements. There are, however, many potential data buses which can be implemented in the spacecraft. Space industry is looking more and more at the implementation of widely adopted terrestrial standards with or without modification. Also, you might see some experiments with wireless communication inside a satellite in the near future. Think of Bluetooth or, and Wi-Fi as examples. The possibilities are endless, but keep in mind that for larger and more expensive spacecraft, reliability typically comes first place. It is therefore likely that you will see most of the newer data buses implemented first on small demonstration satellites. This ends the session on data buses. Good luck with the exercises.